Bonjour. What up, France, and the rest of the world who's here? I want to give a shout out to my brother Brandon, who's here from Jackson, Mississippi. Make sure you stay here after this talk and hear about the important work that they're doing. They're our comrades. Uh, so I'm from Detroit, and Detroit is often in the news, usually for bad things like the bankruptcy that's happening and uh, the crime in Detroit and the, the economy, which is in crisis. And all those things are true, but there's also some very good things that are happening. So in about 15 minutes or so, I want to share with you some of the bright lights that are happening in the city of Detroit. I first, though, want to start, whenever I have the chance to talk before, public, before the public, I always give a praise to the creator, and I'm not trying to impose my spiritual views on you, but for me, that's very important, and also I have to honor my ancestors, those Africans who were stolen from West Africa and brought to the Western Hemisphere and who created the wealth upon which the Western world is built. So having said that, um, I want to tell you a little about the city that I'm from, Detroit. Uh, Detroit is a city of 139 square miles, which has a population of about 713,000 people, according to the 2010 census. And that's down from the height when in, in 1950 it had a population of about 1.9 million people. And so Detroit has approximately a little less than, a little, a little more than one third of the population that it had in 1950. But the geographic footprint of the city has not shrunk, it's the same size. And so the city leaders have the unenviable task of maintaining a city infrastructure with almost a third of the tax base that it had several decades ago. And so that is part of the cause for the crisis that we see in Detroit. You can't understand what's happening in Detroit unless you understand the social construct that we call race. And so in Detroit, the population is currently about 83% African American. And the 83% African American population is surrounded by a ring of suburbs which are predominantly white. It's surrounded by a ring of suburbs because in the late 1950s, 1960s and 1970s, huge numbers of the white population left Detroit and moved into the subdivisions that were developing around the cities as a result and aided by the federal highway system that aided these suburban subdivisions to develop. And so Detroit's majority population is largely impoverished. About 40% of the population lives below the federal poverty line and the rest of the population may be, could be considered primarily lower middle class. So we hear a lot in the news about, we hear terms like Detroit being reborn or Detroit rising from the ashes. And I just want to tell you that the reality is that for the majority of the people in Detroit, that we are still struggling just to survive. So for a certain segment of the population, there is a rebirth happening. But the segment of the population for which this rebirth is happening is predominantly white, and they're predominantly people who have recently moved into the city, into areas that are being gentrified. And in those areas, we see huge amounts of capital being poured in. We see new developments like restaurants and new housing. But for the rest of the city, the majority of the residents are left to languish in poverty. And so in many ways, we have, as someone said earlier today, a tale of two cities happening in Detroit. And so we have the highly capitalized, mostly white, um, gentrified Detroit, and then we have the neighborhoods where the majority of the population live. So I think it's important that you have some context uh, for the work that we're doing in the city of Detroit. So also because of the tremendous depopulation which has occurred in the city of Detroit, about one third of the city's land mass is vacant land land where there are not humans inhabiting the land, but a friend of mine often reminds me that it's really not vacant because it's being re-inhabited by rabbits and pheasants and raccoons and possums and all kinds of wildlife. But about one third of the city's land is not currently being inhabited by human beings. And so we have a tremendous opportunity in the city of Detroit for the development of urban agriculture, an opportunity that doesn't exist on the same scale in almost any other city in the United States. And so in many ways, Detroit has become the urban agricultural capital of the United States. There's approximately 1,500 gardens, including backyard gardens, side gardens, 
school gardens, um, community gardens, and small farms that are officially registered with a network which is called the Detroit, um, the Detroit Garden Network, the, I'm sorry, the Garden Resource Program. And there are many other gardens that are off the radar, people who don't want to be um, recognized at all by any official authorities. And so there's a tremendous number of gardens happening in the city of Detroit. I want to give you a little of the history about uh, those gardens in the city of Detroit. And we have to, of course, start by recognizing that Detroit was inhabited by indigenous people, or Michigan was inhabited by indigenous people, before the French came and colonized uh, what we now know as Detroit. In fact, Detroit is a French word. Um, and these are some of the, the nations of indigenous people who inhabited what is now called the state of Michigan. And we have to recognize that they had indigenous food systems. When the French moved in and started the actual city of Detroit along the Detroit River, they had what was called ribbon farms, these long, narrow farms that started at the Detroit River and ran about two miles towards the north. In the late 1890s, Detroit's Mayor Hazen Pingree, uh, in an effort to stave off starvation in a time of economic depression, encouraged wealthy landowners to share their land with landless people in order to grow food. And so many people say that was the start of the urban agricultural movement in the United States. He is sometimes nicknamed Hazen Potato Patch Pingree. We also have to recognize the great migration that occurred as African Americans were fleeing the southern part of the United States, fleeing the outright terror which existed in the southern part of the United States, and also fleeing the economic deprivation that most of, most of my ancestors and most of my people were facing. As they came north to cities like Detroit, they brought with them their agricultural heritage. In the south, almost everyone was either a farmer or a sharecropper, or at the very least, people had what we called kitchen gardens, gardens that might have been in their backyard or near their houses. And so that was very much a part of Southern culture that they brought with them to the city of Detroit. In fact, the first, my, my first exposure to gardening was in my grandfather's backyard. My grandfather moved to Detroit in the 1920s from Georgia, and he brought his Southern agricultural upbringing with him. In more recent history, in the 1970s, Detroit's first African-American mayor, Coleman Alexander Young, created a program called the Farm A Lot Program, where he encouraged Detroiters to grow gardens on the many vacant lots in the city of Detroit. Even more recently, in the 1990s, we had a group of elders from the southern part of the United States who lived on the east side of Detroit, who created an organization called the Gardening Angels, where they encouraged young people to learn gardening skills, and they helped to propagate a number of gardens in the city of Detroit. We also had a program called Detroit Summer, headed by the great Grace Lee Boggs, which is pictured, who's pictured in the picture at the bottom, and they also encouraged young people to develop gardening, and that contributed to the contemporary urban agricultural movement. In the time I have left, I want to talk to you about the organization that I lead, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, and our main project is called D-Town Farm. D-Town Farm is the largest farm in the city of Detroit. We grow more than 30 different uh, fruits, vegetables, and herbs at that farm. We're training new farmers, new cohorts of farmers each year. We do a tremendous amount of agritourism, exposing people to the great potential of urban agriculture. Uh, we have a very unique program where we encourage people to volunteer, and that's our farm manager actually uh, in the lower, um, the lower picture, and he's holding in his hand what we call D-Town Dollars, a currency that we have created that we exchange with people for their volunteer labor, and they're able to use that currency to purchase the produce that we grow. And instead of, instead of having the picture of the first American president, the slave-owning George Washington, right in the center has a picture of collard greens, and it says on it, community self-determination. And so we're very proud of these D-Town Dollars. We sell our produce at farmer's markets in the city of Detroit, and that's one of our uh, founding members, Mama Janet Seavers, you see in the, in the upper corner, uh, selling at a farmer's market. Uh, this year we're using uh, some techniques to try to reduce the labor, including weed barrier, and this is uh, a couple of months ago as we were rolling out the weed barrier so that we can reduce the amount of labor that we put into weeding at our farm. 
We also have a solar energy project at our farm. We have an eight kilowatt off-grid solar energy project which was designed by a young man in the city of Detroit who was a student at a school that I used to run. And so this is our only source of electricity. We're off the grid and we're generating electricity which is used to operate tools at the farm and used to operate uh, small appliances and what have you. So again, we're modeling not only sustainable agriculture but also sustainable energy usage. We also have a rainwater retention pond a pond that can hold tens of thousands of, rain, of gallons of rainwater that is captured on the lower end of our farm. The east end of our farm is about eight feet lower in elevation than the west end of the farm, and so when it rains, we have a tremendous amount of runoff. We used to see that as a deficit. Now we're seeing that as a plus because we're able to capture tens of thousands of gallons of rainwater in that pond, and then we have a pump which is powered by a solar panel which pumps it into two 2,400-gallon cisterns that we're able to store the water in and use it to water our crops. We also do composting. In fact, the basis, the most important aspect of organic agriculture is healthy soil. And so we do a lot to develop the, the health of our soil, and we do it primarily through the production of compost. We take tens of thousands of pounds of food waste, which is high in nitrogen, and we take thousands of pounds of wood chips, which are high in carbon, and we combine them to make piles about eight feet tall and 50 feet long, and we produce tremendous amounts of compost, which is the primary, uh, the primary thing that we use to revitalize our soil, and you can see two of our farm workers there putting compost into, two of our, into one of our growing areas. We also have an apiary operation. We raise bees both for pollination of the crops and also for the production of honey. But farming is not all we do. We understand that if the food movement is to be sustainable, that we have to intentionally encourage young people to be involved in it. And so we have a youth program that functions at two schools and one church in the city of Detroit, and it's called the Food Warriors Youth Development Program. It teaches young people how to build raised bed gardens, how to tend to those gardens, to cultivate the crops, to harvest the crops, and then we teach them how to prepare them in a healthy way. And we also teach them to be uh, food justice advocates in their community, to be able to look at their community with a critical lens to understand why there are disparities in, in food access and most importantly to work to change those disparities. But it's more than just agriculture. We were the lead organization in 2009 in creating the Detroit Food Policy Council. Now let me be clear that we think what's most important is community self-determination that people should stand up and do things for ourselves. We shouldn't wait for the government, we shouldn't wait for the corporate sector, but we think that government should behave in a responsible manner. And so we created the Detroit Food Policy Council, which was intended to serve as an advisory body to the mayor and the city council of Detroit. The Food Policy Council actually grows out of the city of Detroit's food security policy, which we, we wrote and had unanimously passed by the Detroit City Council in 2008. The largest project, though, that we're working on, and what I spend the majority of my time doing now, is the creation of a new building that we're building on Detroit's main street, which is called the Detroit Food Commons. This is a 20,000 square foot building, about an $11 million project, the cornerstone of which is a cooperatively owned grocery store. We think that in the face of the extractive economies that exist both in Detroit and African-American communities throughout the United States, that it's very important that we begin to use cooperatives as a way of building community wealth, community ownership, and circulating wealth within our communities. But in addition to the cooperative grocery store, which will be in this building, we also will have an incubator kitchen with four workstations where aspiring food entrepreneurs can prepare food in a licensed environment that they can then sell in our cooperative grocery store, or other retail stores throughout the United States, or people who do catering can do that in a licensed environment. And so we're trying to incubate small businesses in order to, again, create community wealth and community ownership. We'll also have in this building a 50-seat cafe and a 6,000-square-foot community meeting space for gatherings such as this. We think that it's important that we create a space so that we have community discourse on how we move forward in a way which empowers communities and doesn't continue to concentrate power in the hands of wealthy white men. 
troubling issues. Um, so there's some very troubling issues in Detroit as there are in the United States and throughout the world. And one of the troubling issues is that even though we have a tremendous amount of vacant land in the city of Detroit, there's inequity in terms of who gets access to that land. And so land ownership and access is a huge, a huge issue in the city of Detroit. And right now the city leaders seem to have the perspective that land should go to people who are very wealthy developers. We have the perspective that land should be distributed to people so that we build power in our communities. Of course, access to capital is always a problem. And then we have this prevailing system, not only in the United States, but throughout the world that we call the system of white supremacy that continues to give privilege, unearned privilege to people who have white skin and continues to marginalize people of African descent and other people of color throughout the world. So if you'd like more information on the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, please uh, feel free to contact us at our website, which is www.DetroitBlackFoodSecurity.org. Again, that's www.DetroitBlackFoodSecurity.org. Thank you very much.